call to worship is from Psalm 80, verses 1 through 3. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and, and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. And Joseph, by your point, you should first thing this morning, it will be out of the red sink of the Lord Hindle. Therefore, God has highly exalted. 
standard version of the Bible. And that's what we have in our views. Isaiah 53, page 780. And if Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, everyone, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is son, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall provide, divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Continue our reading now from the New Testament, Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Luke, chapter 23. And we'll pick up our reading at the 32nd verse. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There's also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. This man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom.
And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness <coughs> over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. But when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and for the revelation it makes of the sufferings of Christ for us. We thank you that according to your will, you sent your son into this world to bear the sentence for our sins, to bear your full justice for us. And we thank you that he was stricken and smitten on our behalf that we would be rescued and saved. We thank you that as he went to that cross, he did not resist, but laid down his life willingly and freely so that he might win our redemption. Father, we pray that your spirit would be at work in us, that you would humble us, that we would repent of our sins, and cling to Jesus, the only Savior given for men. And we pray that you would set aside our sins and renew us by your grace and by the power of your Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Yet saw no corruption. 
On the third day he rose from the dead with the same body in which he suffered, with which also he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth at the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judgment and angels at the end of the world. The confession here highlights a couple of things about Christ's work as our mediator. We, in our past meditation, focused on the fact that he took on our humanity in order to achieve our redemption. He could not just simply will it from heaven or just appear for a period of time as an angel or a ghost or what have you, but he had to take on our humanity because a man must suffer for a man's sin. That's what justice requires. Equal treatment under the law. And so a man had to die for man's sin. Now we've also seen that Jesus was not merely man, but he was also fully God. So the uh, worth of that offering could be sufficient to atone for not only one individual's sins, but for the sins of all those for whom he died. It is a unique, powerful offering for sin that Christ provides at the cross. No other religion offers anything like this. You will not find a mediator like this anywhere else, whether it is in Islam, in Hinduism, in Judaism, anywhere else. Only Jesus is the one mediator uniquely equipped for this role and office. In this chapter, we focus on a couple of elements uh, with regard to his offering of himself. And the first is that it was given willingly and voluntarily. He went to that cross freely for you and I. He was not compelled to do that. He was not forced by the forces of nature or the dimensions of politics or uh, religious uh, bigotry or what have you. He went freely to that cross. At any moment in time, he could have walked away. He could have left it all behind but he voluntarily endured the sufferings of the cross for you. So he loves you. Powerfully loves you. He went through all those sufferings freely and voluntarily for your sake, so that you would be delivered from sin and death, delivered from the wrath of God for sins. And so the confession rightly notes that he went to that cross most willingly. And he uh, went to the cross under the law, fulfilling the law and all of its demands. First in terms of his own perfect obedience to that law. Jesus was subject to the law of God. He was subject to the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments and all our applications. He observed that law fully and faithfully throughout the whole course of his life. And it's that perfect righteousness that he observed in the course of life, that now stands for us. That stands in our place now. And by remaining obedient through death, not only to the law, but also to the special commission that he had as our mediator, he provides for us a perfect and complete righteousness that fully answers all the demands of God's law and justice for us. So when we stand before God, we don't stand and present our good works, our righteousness, or anything that we might hope to think is sufficient. Rather, we stand underneath Christ's righteousness. And that perfect righteousness is ours through faith. And so that comes through His perfect obedience under the law. He obeyed it fully. Even to the point of enduring the grievous torments of the cross. Now, the cross was not merely an injustice for sin. It was not merely a, 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 an evil work on the part of the politicians and the religious figures of that day in crucifying an innocent man. It was also the means by which God punished our sins. That cross, in all of its indignities and all of its injustice, was where God's justice was perfectly satisfied. And so when Jesus bore those pains and sufferings, he did that so that he could bear the pains and sufferings that were due to his people, for us who believe in him. 
He bore the full wrath of God there at the cross for us. There is no more wrath to experience, no more judgments to endure. We are justified in Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because He is our perfect mediator. Who in justice fulfilled God's law for us and in justice suffered on our behalf by enduring God's just sentence against us for our sins. God's justice was further seen in the fact that he was raised on the third day from the dead. Death could not keep its prey, as one of our hymns celebrates. Jesus rose from the dead because he fully answered God's just demands, and now his righteousness is complete. He is raised as God's uh, servant and enters into heaven to be our king and leader, and he rules over us in glory even this day. He sits at the right hand of his Father. And we should note, the ascension of Jesus and his heavenly session is ongoing now. He is now at this moment the King of kings and Lord of lords. He now rules the heavens and the earth. He rules all that takes place in human history and time. That is taking place now. And he's building his kingdom on earth, even now, as the great king. So with all the troubles and sorrows and difficulties of life, you can look up and see Jesus ascended in heaven, now ruling over all. And Satan is under his control. He cannot do anything more than what Christ authorizes him to do. His power is restricted. Christ is king. And he rules at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, praying for us, for our needs, and finally, the confession concludes by saying that he will return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. We will look at that more fully later on in our study. But note that the confession knows this grand climax to all things when Christ returns at the end of history and judges all men at that one moment in time. History will come to its conclusion. Christ will appear in the heavens. All men will see him. The dead will be raised. The righteous will be clothed with immortality. The wicked will be raised. And they will all stand before the judgment seat. The righteous will be separated from the wicked. The wicked will receive their just condemnation and will be sentenced to an eternal hell for sins against an infinite God. And they will forever pay the penalty for that because of their sin. But we who have seen the danger of the wrath of God have found a mediator in Jesus who satisfies the wrath of God for us. And so that judgment will be a time when we are uh, we receive God's full justification and we enter into life eternal because of Jesus Christ. This is your mediator. We need a mediator to stand between us and God and apart from Jesus, there is no hope. So pay close attention and turn to Jesus and find in Him all that you need for life, for salvation, and for your eternal well-being. If someone were to ask you, what is the Word of God like? What would you say? How would you describe the Word of God? Uh, in our hymn of the bond, if you were here last week, you heard the gentleman introduce it. It's number 257. Perhaps you could turn to that and just examine for a moment the text that we're considering. How would we describe God's Word? Well, Edmund Hoder or Potter describes it as a garden, as a mine, as a starry host, as an armory. There's four different analogies to the Word of God that he considers here. And then in the final verse, he sums up all of these analogies together in that final verse. Well, perhaps you could consider uh, if you were writing a poem which makes use of analogy, makes use of this pictorial language, uh, what kind of a poem would you write in describing the Word of God? So we'll sing that number 257. And we'll stand to sing. Thy word is like a garden.
find a way to capture the sense of the text without reading the whole thing. Um, I think what I want to try to do is pick up our reading at the 13th verse and read on from there. Acts 27, beginning with verse 13. Now this records Paul's journey at sea to Rome and the uh, challenges faced on that sea journey. Uh, he's going as a prisoner in the company of a man named Julius, a centurion. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind, called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. When the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that we would run aground on the surface, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they have been without food for a long time, Paul stood up, up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little further on, they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under, under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when, they had, when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, 
They made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest anyone should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of ship. And so it was that all who were, that all were brought safely to land. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your holy word, and pray that your spirit would bless the ministry of your word this day, that it would strengthen our hearts and equip us to serve you in your world today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think during my summers at college, I would read the stories of Horatio Hornblower, a naval sea captain, uh, stories by um, Scott Forrester, at least that was the name on the book. I have since learned that his real name was Cecil Smith. I guess if your name is Cecil Smith, you look for <laughs> another name. In any case, uh, these seagoing adventures were uh, amazing to watch or, or to observe and uh, were a great blessing uh, to read. Uh, Smith himself, or Forrester, had uh, attempted to serve in the military for Great Britain, but was refused because he was too thin. He uh, was athletic enough, but just was not built enough to serve as a soldier. So he went off and, and uh, served uh, in the United States as something of a, a British uh, promoter of the war. Anyway, he has a fascinating insight into uh, the movement of ships and the, the, the care of ships. And as you read this account here in Luke's Gospel, you see that Luke also had a, a minute interest in the, the uh, shipping industry and how ships set sail. And you can see him tracking the ship from port to port, uh, taking advantage of islands and uh, sailing south of the island to use the island as a buffer to protect the ship from the winds coming from the north or from the west. And so uh, Luke tells us these incidental things that somebody who had a real nautical mind, a mind fascinated by ships and sailing, would take note of. It's a, a lengthy journey and uh, eventually it, it begins first uh, at Caesarea where uh, the centurion is responsible to take Paul uh, off to Rome for trial. And Felix was happy to unburden himself with Paul and his trial or his case. So the centurion escorts him and apparently Luke travels along with him because we pick up the first person uh, reading here. We going along here and there and we endured this. And so Luke apparently is on board the ship with Paul and so also is Andronicus from uh, Thessalonica, another uh, disciple who was very faithful to Paul and endured many sufferings with him in the course of his ministry. So these traveling companions are with Paul. Uh, Sir Ramsey, in his uh, uh, comments on th this text, notes that, in, in his opinion, it's possible that Luke uh, and, and uh, his partner traveled as servants of Paul under his uh, ownership, if you will, uh, which uh, would account for the presence and the, the welcome presence there on the ship, but it does seem a little bit odd and perhaps disingenuous for Luke to be a slave or servant of Paul. Uh, I rather suspect that they were simply welcomed along with Paul because of the esteem that the Roman government gave to a Roman citizen, and to Paul in particular, and Luke uh, was able to travel along with him to observe what was taking place. Um, as they make their way on, on towards Rome, they come to a port where uh, it's not a, a very uh, safe port for winter, and they have to make a decision. Will they stay here or make a move off and take a chance to go to Rome. And the decision is made against Paul's objections. 
Paul has done a number of travels at sea already to this point. You might note in Corinthians he says that um, he had been shipwrecked three times and spent a day and, and a night in the deep. So Paul knew something about shipwrecks and knew about sailing. Uh, but the centurion, along with the independent businessman who was running this ship, the captain of the ship, uh, agreed to, to set sail again against Paul's objections. Now, when you look at it on the surface, you've got to say, well, surely the ship's captain knows what his ship can handle. And he, being an experienced sailor, he knows what to expect in terms of the weather and uh, whether it's safe to make their way off towards Rome again. But Paul said, no, we put everything at risk if we set sail here. But against Paul's advice, they went on their way. Of course, uh, they had fair weather to start, but that quickly turned against them, and the storms came upon them. As I looked at this story, and, Paul, and Luke's fascination with nautical things, uh, another thing that strikes me about that is how when the storm comes in, they put ropes underneath the ship to tie the ship and secure it so that the wood on the ships doesn't buckle and fall apart. There are all kinds of these interesting side bits of sailing that Luke records here for us to help us kind of, as it were, sit in that boat with him and understand what's going on, get the feelings of the terror that was overwhelming the sailors and the, the uh, passengers. In any case, why does Luke record all of this? What are we to learn from this event? It seems to me a number of things uh, become apparent. First, at the center of this text, in about the 24th verse or so, you have Paul standing up before the ship, saying that he had received a vision from an angel. An angel met with him at night and told him that everyone on board the ship would be saved, but the ship would be lost that they would have to run aground on some island there and uh, make it to shore. This is at the center of the whole story here. The story revolves around this assurance that Paul gives that everyone will be saved. And I wonder if Luke isn't trying to give us something of a, a if you will, a, a metaphor for God's great work of salvation. How there is... A, a tremendous work of God in saving God's elect from the storms of life and from indeed destruction. And God will safely bring his people, all of them, to his eternal kingdom. Not one will be lost. Uh, I remember C.H. Spurgeon had a sermon years ago uh, in which he talked about uh, the, the travels of Israel out of Egypt off to the land of Canaan. And Pharaoh wanted them to leave something behind. And Moses said, no, nothing will be left behind. Not even a hoof will be left behind. All the people of God, all of their cattle, everything will make that journey to the land of Canaan. And I think it's just these different ways in which God gives us pictures of the work of redemption. And of God's special work for his people. And bringing them all safely to their uh, heavenly shore. You are in God's hands, and you can take comfort in that. I think there are larger uh, other issues that the, the text brings to our mind as well. Uh, this in particular, uh, Paul is there on board the ship with a variety of sailors and, and soldiers and other prisoners, and other perhaps passengers and merchants and what have you. Some 200, was it, 270 different people on board the ship there. Obviously not all of them Christians. Uh, maybe just Paul, Luke, and, and, and Andronicus. I, I don't know if there were any others. Uh, but God nonetheless spared all of their lives for Paul's sake. Why is God so gracious to mankind? Why does he bring them safely through the troubles of this life in many respects? Well, it's because of his people in their midst. The church has a saving effect on the world around them. God's people have a sanctifying influence on those who are around them. Uh, we noted this in our study in Corinthians where 
Paul says that when you have a mixed marriage where one member of the marriage becomes a believer but the other does not become a believer, the unbeliever remains within the marriage and is happy to stay married. And, and Paul says the believer should not leave that unbeliever but stay in that marriage because the unbeliever is sanctified by the believer's presence. That doesn't mean the unbeliever is saved, but there are blessings and benefits that are extended to the unbeliever because of the believing spouse. We can look at that more broadly in a culture. A culture flourishes and prospers because of the presence of God's people in its midst. Remove those people and the culture begins to implode and collapse. We seem to be seeing that very much at work in our world today, where much of American culture is, in many respects, walking away from a sure foundation in the Word of God and the way of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, and is embracing a polytheistic worldview, a kind of pantheistic world in which everybody's right, and everybody's happy, and everybody goes to God. And we all should be tolerated except those Christians who say there's only one way to heaven. And so our culture is seem to be on the a path towards implosion as the culture descend, descends into all kinds of immorality. But God's people are salt and light in the world. They are a sanctifying influence to the world today. And so maybe that Luke was giving us something of a, a picture of that in this work. Another thing that you might note in, in, in this event is uh, the providence of God in governing the course of events. Uh, Paul, in his sanctified reasoning, saw that Winter is coming. The, the, this trip was taking place probably sometime in October, so winter was on its way. Uh, it was said that uh, in, in various uh, charts, uh, seafaring charts, that uh, the seas got dangerous in September and were impossible in November. So here we are in October and taking a trip. Now, God rules the winds and the waves. He has all things under his control. And he controls that ship which has an apostle of the church on board. Now, the Lord in his providence might have given them clear sailing. He might have held back the storms and allowed them to pass through safely without a problem. But God allowed the ship to go through heavy seas and stormy winds. So much so that everyone on board thought they were going to die, including the most experienced sailors on board. And Paul was on board. God is pleased at times through his wise providence to allow his people to go through very hard circumstances. When the winds and the waves beat against our little ship, and all seems lost. And you wonder, why is God allowing me to do this? Why is God putting me through this? Well, He has His purposes. He may have lessons to teach. To teach us individually and to teach the church at large. God governs the course of history and controls all things. There are laws that undergird the course of history that cannot be changed. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that in Christ all things hold together. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17. In Hebrews chapter 1, uh, the, the writer there says that uh, Christ has been exalted and upholds all things by the word of his power. The course of history, the, the the laws of science and of this world are all governed by God and His Word. We have special revelation given to us in Scripture for our salvation, but God's general Word goes out throughout all of creation. And so whether you are looking at science, medicine, art, uh, all kinds of things, they are undergirded by the laws of God 
which can only be resisted for a period of time before you get brought, brought back to center. There are moral laws that govern life. There are moral laws that govern the family, the state, the church. And when you resist those laws, eventually you face catastrophe. Only the Christian has a sure foundation for exploring the world around him and observing its laws and how it functions and operates. Only the Christian can be assured that the sun will rise up the next day or that one season will follow after the next. When you abandon an all-wise creator who governs all things by his word of power and set the world loose on a sea of chance, then you don't know what can happen next. Really, a chance universe has no laws, nothing to guide it. To my mind, that's why Christian cultures have advanced so far as they've had in medicine and all kinds of things, technology, science, because they understood that there are laws that you can depend upon, that you can discover. There's God's providence that controls all things. We live in a world governed by God. And what is more, finally I'll say this, we who are joined to Jesus Christ have a renewed heart and renewed mind, which enables us perhaps to be a little bit more perceptive, should be, about what's going on in the world, or to resist the kinds of pressures that people in the rest of the world face. Because they don't have a hope in God, they don't have God's word to guide them, they don't have faith that God will secure them. And so the Christian should have a sanctified common sense that recognizes the authority of God's law and his responsibility before God's law. Paul was not a sailor, he was an apostle. And ordinarily, you would trust the judgment of a sailor with regard to the course of that ship. But Paul understood the law of God. Paul understood the responsibility to save life. Life was precious. The Roman soldiers didn't have the same concern when it appeared that the prisoners couldn't escape. They were all set to kill them, to save their own skins. There was no moral system there of any value. But Paul had this sense that we are made in God's image, and life needs to be preserved. And so therefore he took a more cautious approach towards what he foresaw as coming towards, the, towards them in the way of a storm. God gives you a sanctified understanding of the world and guards you from the various pressures that are on. The, the centurion was under pressure to bring his captives to Rome. The, the ship's captain was under pressure to bring his cargo to port. Uh, there are all kinds of these pressures on these men. But Paul was pressured by the word of God. The importance and value of human life, human life, as opposed to material things. The godly man, the man who fears God, is a man who develops prudence, mature judgment. Uh, in the book of Proverbs, 22nd chapter, verse 3, Proverbs says that the, the prudent man sees a danger coming and avoids it. He sees what's coming and he makes proper preparations. He sees that he's going to be old someday. So he sets aside a retirement account. He sees that he's not always going to be healthy, so he has some health insurance to protect him. He sees that uh, all, all kinds of things. He sees what's happening in the world around him, the culture that is around him, and he acts to try to change the culture. He sees what's happening in the church, the various trends in the church, and he speaks up and proclaims God's word against a church that might be going astray. Prudent people see what's happening and stand up. And make changes or get out of the way. Has God given you a prudent, God-fearing heart, informed by God's Word, instructed and disciplined by Scripture, so that you can see and understand 
how you should look on the world around you and act accordingly. Paul was guided by this sanctified understanding. And Paul was right. The men were saved as they listened to his instructions. Don't you see something of the cross being pictured here in this chapter in Paul's sufferings? I mean, here he has this uh, meeting with the, the men. He gives thanks to God among all these pagans. He upholds his Christian faith and enforces his Christian faith on them by giving thanks to God in their presence. Were they all believers in Christ? Did they not all probably have their own pagan gods or no god at all? Yet Paul stands up before them, natural as can be, and says, let's give thanks to God. Then distributes that bread. Live as Christians in a fallen world and expect the unbeliever to live accordingly as well. It's their duty to give thanks. If they don't, they need to repent and change. So Luke tells us this amazing story of the apostle at sea facing peril, distress, and trouble, but they finally make it to land. There are all kinds of troubles that we face in life that come our way. In this Mother's Day, there are all kinds of pressures that come on women. All kinds of challenges that you face today to maintain your role or that of your parents as women who are mothers. Raising a family in this world today is a great challenge. You have the great sweep of relativism, socialism, uh, and now gay marriage sweeping across our culture, taking many folks away. The news media, the entertainment media, the educational system is all sweeping many away. And godly women trying to raise their children in this age have a great challenge before them to remain true to God's word in the midst of a decaying, corrupt culture. What will you do? How can you stand against all this? You can stand because you have a sovereign God who controls the winds and the waves. A sovereign God who will bring you through each trial and each trouble. Whether it's a child that's sick or uh, uh, your husband out of work and needing a job and not enough income coming in or all kinds of things that can be, put pressure on you, all kinds of troubles that we face. But you have a sovereign God who loves you. Um, I'll conclude with this. I know it's getting late. Um, one uh, pastor and commenting on this text, noted that he performed a funeral just prior to this for a young woman who died, I believe it was in a, a swimming accident, maybe a pool or a, a creek or something like that, but she drowned. And the text that was read during the, the, the funeral service was uh, the text from Isaiah, though you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. And the, the pastor noted, you know, we go through these deep waters and God doesn't necessarily promise that we'll pass through them alive in this life. But he does promise that he will be with us through the waters. God may have been pleased to take Paul's life at that time. That might have been the end for Paul. But God was with Paul. And he will be with you if you rest in him and take you through the most deepest waters of life, even those of death itself. I will be with you. You have a sovereign God. And death is no problem for him. He rose from the dead. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that your spirit would bless the ministry of your word to our hearts. May we live by faith. May we look at the world today as a world governed by your sovereign word. And may we, with prudence, hear your word and live God-fearing lives to your glory and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's word by bringing before the Lord our morning times and lives.
Let's stand and sing praise to God for all of his blessings to us. Let's stand and sing.
iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever, but because he delights in steadfast love, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Let us rest in God's promise of forgiveness. It's only in here that we have life, freedom from guilt, and the power of sin. And here we have liberty and freedom. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you for your daily provision for our needs. We thank you for this church and for this fellowship that you've committed us to. And we pray that our uh, ministry to each other will be blessed, that we be a help to one another along the way, and that your glory will be evident in us as we sanctify each other, encourage each other, build each other up. And may we be a church set apart to your glory and praise. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen uh, your people and their callings in life. We pray that you would uh, minister to each of us, that we might serve you faithfully in the calling that you have for us. We thank you that you've sanctified the world around us. And there's a place for sailing. There's a place for uh, all kinds of occupations in life. And you call us to understand these things and to develop them to your glory. And so we pray that you help us to occupy ourselves in your world to your glory and praise. And we pray for your blessing on, on that. Be with our families. We thank you for them. We pray that you would sustain them, strengthen and provide for our earthly needs. We pray that you would sustain us even as you provided for Paul and his traveling companions. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, raise up our families, that they might be covenant families, families resting in Christ our Lord and trusting in Him, serving Him by uh, the uh, guidance of your word. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless our mothers this day. We thank you for them. We thank you for their love for us, the care, the self-sacrifice that they've made for us, the many troubles that they've endured in the course of life. And, Lord, we thank you for upholding them and sustaining them. We pray that you would be with each one of them this day. Bless and provide for them, comfort their hearts, and strengthen them, we pray. Uh, Father, we pray for those who are now raising children, that you would sustain and strengthen them, guide them by your word, protect their families, and lead their children in faith. Father, we do pray for those who are in need at this time. We think of John Baldwin's father, and pray that your mercy and grace would be on him and the whole family as uh, he is suffering at this time. We pray that you bring him relief in uh, accord with your grace and love, according to your wise purpose. And we pray, Lord, that you would um, lead the family to make good and careful decisions that honor you and take care of uh, each one. And so we pray your blessing on them. Uh, we pray that you would be with Ella McLaren and give her strength to recover from her congestive heart failure. We pray, Lord, that you would renew her health and strength and watch over her and help us to take better care of her in the days to come. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with others who are suffering from the uh, troubles of life and weakness of the body. We pray that you would uphold glory as she continues to suffer in different ways. As she has back pain and uh, asthma and other respiratory issues. We pray, Lord, that your hand of healing would be on her, that you would strengthen her and provide for her, give her wisdom for her the decisions that she needs to make. We pray that you would be her guide and strength at this time. Uh, we thank you for bringing Carol back here safely, and thank you for protecting her during her fall recently. We pray that you would help her make a full and complete recovery. And we rejoice in her fellowship and pray for your blessing on her and Bob. Father, we thank you for uh, Joe and Nancy Gates and her family. And we thank you for the anticipation of a granddaughter being born. We pray that you give safety to this birth and blessing, and we pray that you bring great joy to the whole family with a new baby, and we thank you for your goodness and kindness to both Joe and Nancy, and pray for your continued blessing on them and your provision for all their needs. We thank you for our time together this day. We pray that you teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn will be to sing the red hymnal, number 93, the children's hymn. I think it speaks
very well of God's providential care over us. Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in his bosom gathered. The 93 couple stands. Holy Spirit.